Hi everybody, and welcome to the Pro Tools 101 video. This is the basics of Pro Tools. In 2022, when I'm filming this, it should be good for several years because Pro Tools are now on a subscription model. And this is very much covering how to get things running from install through to how to getting sound, making sure everything's coming through properly, working with audio and working with MIDI, working with uh, files that you've been sent, all the kind of basic stuff. It's gonna be quite a long video, but there's gonna be a lot covered that will really answer a lot of the questions for somebody who isn't really familiar with using a digital audio workstation or DAW, of which Pro Tools is probably the most famous. I'm Adam Steele, and I'm gonna take you through from start to finish today. Hopefully in part two, part three, part four in future, there will be more where we talk about effects, uh, routing, stems, all that kind of good stuff, but today really is basic stuff. You may have seen me before from the videos on the Reaper series. The Reaper DAW is by far my favorite DAW to use, but I have to acknowledge that Pro Tools is still probably the most commonly used DAW, especially in big studios. So it's good to know how to use a multitude of different softwares, Pro Tools being one of the main ones of them. If you're interested in Reaper, there's gonna be a link, the card there, link it in the description below. And also we have the ultimate Reaper guide through Pro Mix Academy. You can check that out where I really go in depth on everything to do with that. But for now, back to Pro Tools. So in front of me, I have a MacBook, but the process is exactly the same on a PC. Exactly the same, really. And I also have an interface. I highly recommend that you have some kind of audio interface if you're gonna be working with a digital audio workstation. I'm using the Audient ID44 here, which is a really nice premium interface with lots of channels, lots of in and out. You don't necessarily need that. Um, I would recommend though, at least having something like the Audient ID4, which is a two channel interface, or something like the Evo 4, which is slightly more cost conscious, because that's something that you'll come into when we start recording audio and talking about things like latency and audio quality in terms of getting a microphone into a system with a decent sound. You might be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not really gonna, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna be a professional, but I, I still think that it's something that's worth spending some money on is the audio interface thing itself. There's links down in the description below for the 44 and the ID4, which is far more affordable. Their affiliate links are with Sweetwater in the US and Toman in Europe. And I'm sure if you're in another territory, there are loads of other options that you can find to buy that kind of thing. So back to the software on screen. So if you don't already have Pro Tools, and I, I actually don't on this particular machine, you might want to get yourself a free 30 day trial. So I'm at avid.com slash get slash Pro Tools trial. That may change in the future because a company like Avid changes their website quite a lot. Avid are the people who make Pro Tools, by the way. So if anyone starts talking about Avid, they have software that is quite often referred to as Avid, which is the video editing software, and then its sister software for audio is Pro Tools. So that's what we're looking at right now. So I'm gonna put in my email address, tell it I'm not a robot. Create my account, again. It's putting a lot of personal details on screen, which is why I'm blurring them out. Because, yeah, giving out personal details, never a good idea. Now it's asking, do I have an existing iLock account? Now iLocks are, I've got a little silver thing here. This is an iLock. And this is a USB uh, dongle 
that keeps a lot of my software licenses on. If you're getting into audio production, again, I highly recommend that you get one of these iLock dongles. Some uh, software can use the iLock app and either use a cloud connection or they can use uh, a license straight to your computer. But if your computer, if your Mac dies, it can be difficult to restore that. If it's a cloud-based license and your internet is down or the cloud servers are down, then it just won't work. So again, I recommend getting yourself an iLock dongle. A, a link is in the description for that as well. It's something that once you've got one, that will, you know, if, if you don't break it, and I've not broken my iLock 3, which is the most recent revision right now, then it will last you years and years and years. I've got, I think, 200 and something licenses on there because I use lots of extra plugins from third-party people, all that kind of really fancy, expensive stuff because I do this for a living, as you can see behind me. Uh, so you might not have to worry about that, but it's something that's worth thinking about. And now they also make a USB-C version, which is thinner and can fit natively into something like a MacBook. I've got mine plugged into a little USB dongle dock thing here that's uh, plugged in so that I can plug in weird and wonderful stuff. Again, on a PC, probably not a problem, but USB-A, which is the big square one, is going the way of the dinosaur, and USB-C, this the, the small one, is, is coming in and becoming kind of the standard these days. So keep that in mind. So I need to put in my iLock user ID. There we go. Avid is requesting access to my iLock account. So I can put in my password there. Authorize. We are also going to need the iLock software, which is kind of the counterpart to the iLock dongle. That's not just Pro Tools specific, that's any audio software that uses iLock, which if you then switch to Cubase, Reaper, anything like that, uh, if you're using other plugins that use iLock, then you're still going to need that iLock software. So, we must download Avid Link Desktop App, which installs and manages Avid software. Let's do that. Keep. Get this downloaded. And get this open. Allow. Continue. Yes. Put my password in because I'm installing software. Again, up to now, if you're working on a PC instead of a Mac, this is identical. Okay, that was successful. Here's Avid Link. No, not gonna do that. I accept the terms of the license agreement. Oh. I've got to put my computer's credentials in here. And that's now installing Pro Tools for us. Ah, and apparently we're queued for a small update on Avid Link too. So whilst that is downloading, I'm going to go separately to ilock.com, ilok.com. And I'm gonna go in here and close these little notifications because I don't need them. And when it opens, I'm going to download the license support installer, which in this case is the Mac OS one. If you're on Windows, it's the Windows one. I now don't need to download that because I did that previously because I use other software on here that uses the iLock. But once that's installed, I will show you what comes up. In my applications folder somewhere, there we go. iLock license manager comes up. Now the iLock software is quite slow but it works. It works fine for me as long as I keep on the most recent version. It's asking me about an update. I will do that later, but yeah, do keep on the latest version if you can. I'm going to sign in and here's this whole host of, of plugins that I use. But there's the Avid Complete Plugin Bundle. Pro Tools Ultimate Subscription, Pro Tools Intro. I'm not using Pro Tools Intro, I'm using Pro Tools Ultimate Subscription, which I want to right click on that and activate it. I'm going to I'm going to activate it onto my iLock dongle here. Confirm. It looks like uh, I might be able to 
uh, activate that to the cloud. Not that I would want to, like I said earlier, but I can definitely add the uh, the dongle version for Pro Tools Ultimate. It looks like you can't do it to the computer. So yeah, get yourself an iLock dongle if you didn't already have one. But that is now depositing the and activating, there we go, successful, the license to use Pro Tools onto this dongle. So whenever Pro Tools is opened, it will ask this dongle, do you have Pro Tools? Is it current? Is it relevant? At which point, also with the plugin bundle, I'm going to activate that. It's going to ask, and I'm not going to do that to the computer. I'm going to do that to the iLock as well. It's going to ask me, yes, I'm about to activate 26 licenses for the plugins. That is fine. Yes. It's going to be one of those things where you can't use it. Uh, on any other computers if you only activate it to that computer. I've got the studio computer behind me, MacBook here, and at home I have a mix set up as well. So I keep everything on iLox and for some of the software that just uses a USB stick, I use that too. Because that means I can just move my licenses around and I don't need to buy two or three copies of everything. Because there's only one person, even though there's three computers, I'm using one at once. So yeah, successful activation, fantastic. And there is also a groove cell, which I can activate and I may as well. So that's now all done. Let's go back to Avid Link. That's still downloading Pro Tools, but it's not far off finishing at this point. Okay, so it's asking me about my primary field. My primary field is music creation and production. I self identify as a mixing engineer. Primary genre for me is probably rock. Skill level uh, advanced. Primary goal. Why are you asking me this? I'm just going to click something. And now it's installing. So, see you in a minute. One more thing whilst Pro Tools is installing, I was talking about having an interface before. Now, with Macs, sometimes you might think that an interface would just work. That is very rarely, if ever, actually the case in terms of getting the best performance out of Pro Tools with the equipment we have. What you would always do, and I would always recommend this, PC or Mac, anybody, go to your manufacturer of your interface's website and get the latest drivers for your interface. They are the thing that goes in between Pro Tools or the other software and your interface that make them talk in the most efficient way and mean that any potential bugs or problems are all ironed out and so that every channel can be seen, all that kind of stuff. So what we're going to do here is go to audient.com because I'm using an audient interface to audient here. I want to go to products. In my case, it's the ID 44. And there's the downloads link. So I would, in my case, download the Mac OS drivers. You might want to download the Windows drivers and get that installed. It's an easy installation. And then in my case, that then gives me the ID interface. So in applications, I've got ID, which comes up with this wonderful thing, which is a big mixer. So that's something we might come to later when we talk about monitoring and being able to hear yourself, potential problems. But yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get back to the Pro Tools installer. All right, that took a while, but everything is now installed. So it's time to open Pro Tools. I'll find it under applications. And is it under P for Pro Tools, LMNLP? Of course it is, there it is. I'm gonna drag it onto my uh, taskbar down there and open that up. And this might take a minute. Ah, it's telling me the iLock stuff's not running, probably because there's been some sort of update. Uh, let's try running iLock again. I might have to restart the Mac at this point. Yeah, after the install, I'm going to restart. Okay, and we are back. After a restart, it looks like iLock is working, so let's try Pro Tools. 
and see if it all works properly. Quite often after installing things, a restart is kind of necessary. It's going to ask me for my password. That is fine. Typical uh, recent Mac OS, they are very uh, secure with a lot of their, uh, you know, well, security. They don't want you to have viruses and things, so you've got to put your password in at every last opportunity. Here we go. It would like, to, it's not even allowed to access my documents folder without my permission. So, audio input for Pro Tools is disabled. It will say it'll like to access the microphone. Yes. And then at some point soon, we'll have to then tell it we would like it to use our interface. Expiration warning. Yep. This is because I've got trial. It's giving me the 30 day trial warnings. I'm going to get a lot of these. This is going to be quite annoying. Uh, plugin. Ah. Uh, now it's going to go through all of my third party plugins that I already have installed. You won't have these installed, uh, but I have to go through all the activation. Uh, pain in the backside. So uh, stand by, I'll be back with you very shortly. I'm gonna plug in my USB with all my licenses and watch it go. Something I could probably mention at this point whilst all my plugins go through their thing is if you do have any external plugins that you've bought, then you may have heard terms like VST and AAX, all that kind of stuff. A VST is a plugin format that works with Cubase, Reaper, quite a lot of the different software programs. Pro Tools uses its own format called AAX. And if you're using a really modern version of Pro Tools, you'll want to be downloading 64-bit AAX files for your platform, whether it's Mac or Windows, so that they then work natively with your Pro Tools installation. It's also worth noting that if you didn't get the 30 day trial of Pro Tools, if you actually paid for it, you're not going to get all this kind of stuff about licenses expiring. Okay, after that lengthy process, we're here. <laughs> Now it's asking, would you like to send diagnostic data? Why not? Fine. And getting started. There are some templates. Personally, I like to make a completely blank project to start off with. That's usually what I like to do. So I'm going to go to create and I'm going to do local storage because I don't want to do the cloud stuff. And let's call it 101 basics. I want the file type to be wave. 24-bit. Uh, Sample rate is something you have to choose. 44.1K uh, is usually CD format. 48K is kind of generally accepted as film, YouTube, TV, all that kind of stuff. 48K pretty much. And then there's more exotic numbers as well. And then I'm going to change the location. It's in documents, so I'll leave that for now, but you should put that somewhere that isn't just a documents folder. And I'm going to hit create. And that's going to build this window up. Now, the first thing I'm going to do before we do anything is go up to the top to the setup menu and choose the playback engine. So the playback engine for me, I don't want to use the Pro Tools aggregate IO, which is what combines all the different interfaces that you might have together. What I want to do is use the audience ID 44. If you don't have an interface, you can listen by using on a Mac, especially something like the MacBook speakers or headphones if they're plugged in. But in my case, I want to do ID 44. It will save and close the session. I want to hit yes. And then I can choose a hardware buffer size. I'm going to go with 512 samples because that's uh, nice and safe. Smaller numbers give me uh, a, a lower latency, which means it's much faster before I start to hear results through the software. But if it's a computer that's kind of under a heavy load, that can start to cause dropouts, the infamous CPU overload window from Pro Tools, all those kinds of issues. So. I'm going to hit OK now, and it's going to bring my uh, project back up. So now we have a project. All right, so 
We've got Pro Tools open. Now we're going to start making some sounds. And the first thing that I'm going to do before we start recording anything is make sure that we're actually getting sound and show you how to import a file, get it onto a track and make sound yeah. before we get to the next bit. So what I want to do is go to file and import audio. And by importing audio, that's going to give me this window, import audio. So I've already gone to a folder where I know I have a track that I can use. So I'm going to use this particular thing that I made for a video for, for two notes. And when I click on it, it tells me it's a wave file, sample rates, bit depth, all that kind of stuff. I can now import that. It says that can be added directly to the current session. That's very nice to know. Let's see if there's anything that I can find that is a different sample rate. Ah, so I've got things like a DI here, which it says I can add directly to the current session, but it will play back at the wrong speed. So what I'm going to have to do with that is hit convert. And that is going to convert that track, which isn't at the right sample rate to the sample rate that this project is using so that everything's consistent and works properly. So the one that I had before, I'm going to hit add the other one here. I'm going to hit convert when I hit open, that's going to bring them both. I'll choose the destination folder and that's giving us the option to put them in the same project folder. So I'm going to hit open there. That's now converted out of the track and I'm going to add these to the clip list instead of making a new track because you might already have a track. You might not and we've not come to that yet. So I'll hit OK and on the right hand side of the screen where it says clips, I now have those two files, one of which was the base DI that we added and one was the stereo track, which if we drop that down there, that little arrow that shows us two mono sides, which we could add. So what I need to do now is add a track so I can go to the track menu at the top and click new. Now I'm going to have one new stereo audio track. See how this is kind of quite logical. So I'm making a number of new tracks with this configuration uh, in this style in samples name. And I'm going to call this track and hit create. Now that comes up blank, but now I can go over to that clip that I had earlier and drop that where I need it. And by dragging and dropping, that's now in there. If I hit play, before you hit play, make sure that your volume knob on your interface is relatively low. You might find that if that's automatically at full, you might get absolutely deafened. And um, if that needs to come out of any headphone outputs, that might be something you need to do in the routing for your interface. Maybe a lot of them by default send the same main one and two outputs to headphone outputs as well, which we'll again talk about in a minute. But if I hit play on this, this is going through some extra stuff so that you guys can hear it. So if I hit play. And that's coming out. That's also coming out of these headphones. And so that's nice and easy for me. The uh, bass that we converted earlier, I'll make another new track, but this time I'll make a mono track, one new mono audio track called bass. And I can drop this base DI clip further over. And because that's been converted, that's now in the right sample rate and isn't going to play back super fast like a chipmunk or slightly slow, which if you've come in contact with those kind of issues, this is how you fix it by importing and converting at the same time. Now let's say this was a project that isn't quite the time we wanted. That's where we look at the tempo map because the tempo here by default is 120 BPM, which is a nice easy two beats every second, which is why a lot of DAWs start with it as a default because it's a nice easy number to work with. But you might need that to be faster or slower. In the top right is where the tempo 
is and we can manually add that. If that needed to be faster, I could add say 140 or if it needs to be slower, I could try 100 and I can then turn on a metronome. Next thing, if you need to hear a click is you need a click track. So we're going to go to track at the top and at the bottom of that menu is create click track. We give that a quick click and that has made us a click track now that we can listen to. And that is now faster or slower as we need it. We can automate that and move it around as if it was another track. I'm going to move that right to the top of the project because that's where I would like it to be. But then we can do whatever we like here with different bits of these tracks. Now let's say we wanted to listen to a part of this particular track over and over and over. So I'm going to select that part of this track and I'm now going to loop that. Now this is quite often best done by using the grid mode. Now if we look at the top left, we've got shuffle, spot, slip and grid. Now spot is where you can choose exactly where you're gonna be. Slip is what we've been using where we can use a little bit and move things round off the grid. And then grid is what moves things exactly per the grid so that if we're working to an exact tempo, we can move things exactly where they should be. So what I want to do is now I'm on grid mode, select the section that I need just by dragging the mouse because we're in this mode that I'll talk about in a minute, which is where all three of these different modes are selected at once. You can see on our minutes and seconds at the top there, that's all selected. And I'm going to go into options and select loop playback. Make sure that's on. And now when I hit play, that's going to go to the end of that and then start that little section over and over and over and over until we get bored or time ends. like so. And we can tell it's on loop as well because the play button has this little kind of circular motion on. If we right click on the play button, we can turn off loop from there. And we can see it's gone from a looping little icon to the play icon again, which makes things nice and visual for us. Now let's move on to recording some audio. Now we get on to the interesting world of recording audio. So I've plugged a microphone into input one on my ID44 interface, and that's what I'm gonna to use to test this whole thing out. So what I'm gonna do first is add myself a whole new track, and I'm gonna go new mono track, and I'm just gonna call this vocal. And I have moved the time that's blinking to after the other tracks, that little bass clip that we had and the audio clip. We'll come back to those in just a minute. And so what I want to do is make sure that this is assigned to the correct input. And this is where we start looking at the mix window, because so far we've been looking entirely at the edit window. And I want to look at this, which is the mix window. I went to window and mix. And so if we make this bigger, a lot of people that I see using Pro Tools will have the mix window take up an entire screen, uh, maybe on a second screen or just flicking between the two, uh, but you can resize that as needed. And so now we can see everything in the mix window. And it's a very important side of Pro Tools because it's where you determine what's plugged in where, what audio is going where, what MIDI is going where, all that kind of stuff. And so that's how you build up quite a complex mix. So our vocal channel that we made is here and I want to change the IO. So the IO, I'm gonna to change to interface to analog one because this is plugged into analog channel one on the ID44. And so if I had more digital inputs, that kind of thing, the choices on that are all here, they're all listed. And so you just choose the appropriate one and make sure that's ready to go. Now, back in uh, edit window world, I can hit record on this and it won't record straight away, but it'll do what's called arming for record, which means that when we're ready to record, we will hit the appropriate buttons and that track will begin recording. 
any tracks and you can have as many as you like that are armed for recording. As soon as we hit the record buttons, they will all start to write files on those tracks. So that's how you record a full drum kit, full band, all that kind of stuff all at once. Or if you already have a track you're recording along to, you don't arm that one for recording, but you do arm, say, a vocal or whatever it is on the top that you want to record. So in this case, if I now hit record, nothing happens again because that's now armed record enable, and then we hit play. So it's record, then play. And now that's running. If I grab this microphone and I talk into it, we should be able to see a level. It's not very much. I'll turn up the gain on the interface. There we go. And now we can see after a couple of seconds, the audio is starting to come in on that channel. Now, if I hit stop, there's our vocal. Now, if I go back a little bit and hit play, we should be able to hear that. There we go. And now we can see after a couple of seconds, the audio is starting to come in. Now, we couldn't hear that whilst we were recording because record input monitoring was not enabled. And we have two options here. Next to the record button on the vocal, the arm button is track input monitoring. I touch that and suddenly that's now coming out of the audio interfaces, monitor outputs, headphone outputs. Be careful with that coming out of monitor outputs because you can make feedback happen where the microphone's making sound back through the speakers in a horrible infinite loop that makes it make these kind of noises that are not pretty. So yeah, do be careful with that. So when you play back the track, if you don't want to hear what's already on the track and you only want to record, that's when you hit input monitoring. Otherwise, with that off, you will hear the original track on the interface there. and you'll hear yourself over the top see after a one two one two one two one two yeah it's it's once once the tape gets rolling so to speak that's when i want to hear, hear that input monitoring if i don't want to hear any input monitoring at all what i'll have to do is go into the mix window and turn the record fader all the way down so that there's absolutely nothing coming through but then that's that's only when the kind of tape is stopped so to speak the alternative option is to go, in this case, into the ID kind of mixer app. If you're using a different brand of interface, you're going to have to consult your manual and turn up the fader that goes direct monitoring on whatever you've got, which in my case is going direct from mic one straight out to the headphones and straight out to the monitors. And that is giving me a near zero latency version, but with no effects processing, no compressors, EQs, anything that you might be using in Pro Tools. It's just completely raw. If you're finding that you're getting this weird kind of ghost effect where you've got a double of the uh, Pro Tools audio and the kind of direct monitoring, which makes it sound like there's kind of a chorusy weird effect, make sure one of those two faders, either this one here or the one in Pro Tools is turned down. So in the case of me having this, say, bass, if I wanted to record over the top of that, I could hit record arm on the vocal, make sure the record arm isn't on on the bass, and then I can record enable and hit play. Two, three, four, a one, a two, a three, a four. Now, if I wanted a better performance, I'd be wearing the headphones, obviously, but this is just a practical demonstration. Same with the monitors. If it's not a microphone, if it's something like a guitar with a virtual guitar amp or something like that, you can use the Pro Tools monitoring and record over the top of something like a drum loop. However you want to do it, that is how you get going. As you can see, I had a bit of a move around on the desk here because it's time to talk about MIDI. Here's a keyboard. This is a MIDI keyboard. You don't need one nearly this extravagant. Um, this is an 88 note keyboard and you can use a tiny little one or a drum pad or whatever it is that you would like to use that is a MIDI uh, keyboard. The way that I'm using it, this is what's called a MIDI controller. This doesn't actually make its own sound. Uh, you will see things like, you know, a, a piano that's got MIDI, but on its own, it makes its own sound. This is not that. This is literally just kind of an empty shell, but with keys in and a little USB thing that sends MIDI note information over to here. And so that's how MIDI tends to work in Pro Tools and other, um, other DAWs. 
Um, if you are using something like a, a piano with MIDI, uh, what you might want to do is turn the volume off on that instrument and just use either a USB cable is, is most ideal. This is a USB uh, keyboard, so we don't actually need any separate MIDI cables because if you see MIDI, it's this five pin round DIN cable thing, uh, which is kind of the old traditional way of doing MIDI. But this is MIDI over USB so that we can plug this straight into this little dongle dock here thing that I've got and that just works. This is an example is an old MIDI interface. You can see the dust on it uh, from Motu that's got loads of MIDI inputs on there and you plug a USB cable in there and that goes in to the Mac or the PC for more traditional MIDI keyboards. I say MIDI keyboards, anything that has MIDI, whether it's in, out, uh, if you're using something like a synth that, that takes MIDI in, I can actually play MIDI notes from Pro Tools into that. But that's, that's, we'll talk about that in a second. Do know that MIDI on its own doesn't make a sound. MIDI is just a set of instructions. If I press a key on this keyboard, all that's saying is it literally is a tiny little piece of code that says that key just got hit, it got hit this hard, and that note is now on. And when I let go, it goes, that note went off. We need to, in Pro Tools, configure that to make some kind of sound. And depending on whatever kind of sound we want, that's something that we have to do now. Now, because this is a new MIDI keyboard and I've changed the layout, I did have to quit Pro Tools, plug in the MIDI keyboard, open Pro Tools again. And now we're on the same session. What I'm going to do is firstly bring up the mix window because it's much easier to see how we're gonna do this in the mix window. So I'm gonna go to track, new track, and I'm going to have one MIDI track. I'm gonna call this MIDI one and hit create. Now, if we look at the IO section here, this is something we've looked at a couple of times, but not really. The IO on every track, the first drop down is what's coming into that track. And the second one is the output. So where that's going for the audio so far, we've had these set to default input one for the mono stuff, input one and two maybe for a stereo track output of main one and two, we're keeping it simple, but you can change that. When it comes to MIDI, we've got in and we've got out. So the in by default is set to all, and that can be a bit of an issue because then if we've got more than one MIDI thing plugged in, they will all then record straight to this channel and that can get very messy very quickly. So what I'm going to go to is this predefined menu, key station 88, which is this keyboard, and there are two MIDI ports on that, so I'm going to go port one, channel one, because MIDI has 16 channels, which back in the 80s and 90s was really useful to have one single MIDI cable and have 16 channels. One might be a piano, one might be a drum kit, one might be like a trumpet sound, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't tend to use it very much that way anymore, but it's still in there which means that we need to know about that. Generally speaking, by default, a lot of these keyboards will put their notes out on channel one. And if you're not getting any sound on channel one for drums, often that's on channel 10 because that's just what it always used to be. So keep that in mind. Now we've got the outputs and right now it's either no output, which means that that MIDI will record, but it will just record a bunch of notes or We've got predefined and right now that port one means that will just go straight back out of the keyboard, which isn't really any use to us. And it's not going to make any sound. If I go back to the uh, edit window and hit record, well, I'll hit record arm on MIDI one, then record enable and record. You'll see down the bottom it's recorded. And if I start hitting notes, you will see when I hit stop, that that now is in MIDI item, which we can open by double clicking and that will show us some notes or a lack of notes. Ah, by having it go back out of the MIDI one, you can see here, if I touch this gently, 
the keys come down a little and the harder I hit them, the more we see that volume, which is the MIDI notes. And you can see how it goes, instead of the decibel meters we were seeing on the, on the audio channels, instead we get zero to 127. Those are the numbers that tell us how loud a MIDI note is, zero being the quietest, 127 is the ultimate maximum. If ever you do anything like drum programming, you might hear drum programmer guys going, don't use 127 or whatever, because that's just the ultimate maximum loudness. But again, getting off topic. Record here. You can now see a load of uh, MIDI notes where I just hit them. And this down here is a MIDI editor, which I can pull up by changing the size of that. And I can look at those MIDI notes. If one's too long or it's in the wrong place or too short, I can drag those around because they are just notes. They're just information. Now let's get some sound. Back to the mix window here. This is all well and good, but it doesn't make any sound. What we need is an instrument. So we need to go make another track and that would be new from track at the top and change the track type to instrument track. I'm gonna make this stereo because mostly they are stereo. And I'm gonna call this noises and hit create. Now that alone isn't gonna make any noise. We need an insert, which we've not really talked about yet. Inserts are where our sounds go. Those are where things like an EQ or a compressor might go, which means that in between the very start of the signal and what we hear, we are literally inserting a thing in there. In this case, we're going to be inserting the instrument in between the MIDI notes and the speakers. Because you've got to think of it like a cable. So on an audio track, we would be inserting something like an EQ after the sound we've made and before we hear it. In this case, it goes MIDI notes, insert the instrument, output is. So we're going to add, in this case, a multi-channel plugin, and we're going to use an instrument, and way down the bottom is expand, which comes with Pro Tools, so I'm going to use that. And so that still doesn't make any sound. And the reason it doesn't make any sound is we've not told that MIDI where to go. So that MIDI on its own, we can see it going on the screen there, but it's not going anywhere. So the I.O. now, the output part of the I.O., the second one, has changed. And now we can choose noises expand and click channel one because that's where expand is. And now if I hit something, now we get noise because the MIDI's coming in that we can see and it's coming in from our keyboard as we've defined it. It's going out to the instrument channel and the instrument channel is then picking that up and converting it in expand into something else. Now in the presets of Expand, I'm just gonna pick something else. Let's say a polysynth. I'm almost picking at random here. And there we go. You can choose any instrument, whether it's one that comes with Pro Tools, whether it's one that you've bought separately and add them in exactly like this. And now we're going to talk about processing, as in inserts and sends. I'm not gonna go absolutely crazy on them because that's something for another part. That's like part three or part four when we talk about routing and clever stuff. But let's talk about that now. Okay, so now I've got this little bit of MIDI that I've recorded. I've got audio that I've recorded. And now we get into the world of effects. A little bit, I'm not gonna go crazy. But if I hit play on this MIDI, that's gonna send through to the instrument and... Make some noises, like it says on the track name. I'm gonna make that smaller. And the same with the audio that we made before. That makes noises.
or at least it's supposed to make noises. Ah, the fade is down. There we go. And now we can see after a couple of seconds. So if you were doing this in a full song context, you would have more of a song. But uh, these are all we need to know in terms of what's where. And this is where the mix window really comes to our rescue. If I hit play, you'll see this vocal go. There we go. And now we can see after a couple of seconds, the audio is stuck. And now I might want to use an EQ or a compressor or something on that vocal. And those go in where the inserts are, where it says at the top, inserts A to E. In those inserts, you can add, insert, whatever kind of processing you like. And that will take the entire signal of that track and do to it whatever you say. So in my case, I'm going to go to a plugin and I said I'm going to use an EQ. So I'm going to pick EQ and I'm going to use one of Pro Tools' basic EQs. There we go, the 304E equalizer. This is one that came with Pro Tools, so I just picked it. That'll do, and so I'm gonna find what I need and maybe say, take the mids, turn them down, take the bass, turn it up, take the treble, turn it up, and that should sound. There we go. And now we can see, after a couple of seconds, the significantly different. And the same with anything else. I, if I now put a compressor underneath that, that will then process through the compressor and it will go through the insert effects one at a time going down that list. 304C. So let's use that. There we go. And now we can see after a couple of seconds, the audio is starting to come in on that channel. Now if I hit stop. There we go. So now I have an EQ and a compressor on that channel. Uh, you can do that with an instrument after the actual instrument effect. Any inserts afterwards will add in there. Now, if I wanted to add a reverb uh, or a delay, I'm going to use something called a send. Now, a send gets interesting. Sends are where we start thinking about our music in terms of the way that somebody working in analog would work. So let's say I've got something like I want a reverb where I want a little bit of reverb on the snare, a little bit on a guitar, quite a bit on a vocal, not so much on something else, but I want it all to be the same reverb. And that means I only have one set of controls that I have to change if I want to change the sound of that reverb. I only have one slider if I want to turn the sound of that reverb up and down. And that makes my life easier in terms of management of something like that. Then we would have a separate reverb track and we would send some audio to it from the other tracks. That is easier for the CPU. It's easier on the mind, I find a lot of the time. And it means that you can also do things to that send like you can bring that up and down as you need it with what we call automation. You can use other plugins on that. So let's say you wanted to make a reverb sound a bit thinner. You could put an EQ on that reverb that doesn't affect your original tracks. That's quite important because then you've got the freedom to do things separately and really manage your sounds. And that's how you get a real kind of professional result. So I'm going to go to track and new, like I keep doing, but this time I'm going to add an aux input track. This way, I'm gonna call this a uh, verb, but this isn't expected to have any actual audio on it, this aux track. So what I can do is have no input set for this, and then we can use sends, where it says send A to E on the other tracks, we can use that. So firstly, let's set up a reverb. So on the uh, inserts for the reverb, which is where we would put the, the reverb sound, I'm going to go multi-channel plugin, reverb, air reverb, because I know that comes with Pro Tools. And for now, I'm just gonna leave that over there on the fairly stock standard settings. If I listen to my vocal now, if I hit play. There we go. And now we can see after a couple of seconds, the audio is starting to come in. 
there's still no reverb on it because we've not told Pro Tools to send any sound from the vocal to the verb. So in where it says sends, I'm going to click in one of these spaces and where I've got options, I'm going to go down to the bottom to track and verb. So now that's sending to the reverb and it's probably going to be really reverby. There we go. And now we can see after a couple of seconds, the audio is starting to come in on that channel. Right, this is where buses become important in Pro Tools because what we're going to do is have this reverb have its own bus, which means that all the tracks that we want to send to this reverb will go through that bus. In this case, I've gone to the reverb and set its input to bus three and four, because why not? Bus three and four, and now, when I go back to my vocal, I can add a send that goes out of bus three and four. And bus three and four was lit up there because something was defined to it. And now if I click on that, it gives me a fader for that. And then as I click play, I can turn that up and add reverb as needed. There we go. And now we can see after a couple of seconds, the audio is starting to come in on that channel. Now if I hit stop, and you can now hear that's very reverby, and then you can blend that to taste. But also, if I now go back to my edit window, where I've got the MIDI instrument playing, I can also go back to my mix window and have the same kind of thing, ascend from the noises out to bus three and four, and then bring up the fader on that too. We should be able to and so now both my uh, instrument and my vocal are sending to exactly the same reverb. I only needed one copy of the reverb. And if I change any settings in that reverb, change the room size, reverb time, all those kinds of things, that will affect everything. You don't necessarily want to do that. There are exceptions. But as a general rule of thumb, things like delays, reverbs, maybe parallel compression on drums, that kind of thing where we're starting to get fancy, this is how you would do it. And that way everything is accounted for and keeps things nice and tidy. It does mean that you end up using a few more tracks, but in the long run, it's really quite good for the mind, I find. The last couple of things I'm going to show you in the basics video that should really get you going are a couple of editing tricks. Let's say I've got this chunk of audio here and I didn't want the start of it. I can hover over the left side or the right side until it becomes this kind of bracket shape. And then I can drag that to where I need it. And that means that any background noise in between is, is gone. Very useful so that when you're recording a song, you can get rid of the bits where you kind of cough or, you know, the intro, outro. Let's say that there is a section in there that you really didn't want. What you can do is click the cursor to the right place and there is a separate function. If I right click, there is separate further down or the shortcut for that is Command E, which I think is Control E on Windows and that has now split this into two separate parts. And so from the two separate parts, I can then do exactly what we just did by getting that little bit that we don't want, whatever that may be, and then just dragging across that, or just separating twice and deleting the middle bit, whichever works for you. Now, if you need this to fade in and fade out, then you go to the top left or top right of that, that particular chunk of sound, and it will turn the mouse cursor into this block. And when it's the block, that is your fade in. So we used to have to render these. That's not a problem anymore. We just have to hover around till we find it. There it is on the right hand side. And I have to be pretty accurate. It's quite difficult with a trackpad. But if I can slide in, there we go. You can now see that's a whole big that line is a fade out. After a couple of seconds, the audio is starting to come in on that channel. Now if I hit stop. There we go. So fade ins, fade outs and cuts, 
very important for uh, splitting and trimming and making sure everything is nice and neat and tidy. And of course, by clicking, if this is slightly forward or slightly back, if it's slightly early, slightly late, we can move that around in our song as well. Uh, this is all on slip mode, but of course, if I click grid, that will now edit those starts and stops and move the file to the grid. So you can move things if they're already in time, but out by a beat or out by a bar, you can move them with the grid. Or if they're very slightly out, you can move by slipping instead, which is generally how I tend to work because I don't tend to work with electronica and that kind of thing, which is very rigid. So there we go, some real basics for you. I hope this has been really useful. Thank you everybody for watching. If you want to support us on Patreon, there is a link down in the description, patreon.com slash hoppolestudios. That is our studio. I'm Adam Steele, and this is a massive thank you to all our current patrons. Uh, check out the uh, Reaper Ultimate Guide if you're interested in Reaper. I personally prefer it, Pro Tools is really good. And stick around at some point in the future, I'm going to be doing more parts in this series to talk about slightly more advanced stuff in terms of more complex routing, how to use external effects better, all that kind of stuff, virtual drums, all that goodness. But for now, I will say thank you and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.